Okay. So, am I supposed to read the first one? How do you play? Be vulnerable and don't judge. Yeah, that's cool. I'm, I'm, I'm right with that. I think we're just going to go as they are. Okay. Name one thing you love about the way you've been raised. Wicked, mashallah. I don't take any credit for this at all. I never remember hearing my parents gossip or backbite, ever. And we are our parents. Whatever, the way we're raised is the way we grow up. And as a result, I have no interest. It's not from like good character or righteousness. I have no interest in what anyone else is doing. I'm so grateful to my parents that they never gossiped or backbite about anyone. Alhamdulillah. Tell me something about my mother that I didn't appreciate until I got older. I didn't appreciate how unbelievably strong my mum was. My dad had serious mental disorder when we were growing up. And my dad used to have breakdowns. And we as children were totally unaffected by that. Now I don't mean unaffected in the, in, in, in the sense of emotionally. Seeing your dad upset always upsets you unaffected in as much as my mum held it together so well that we never felt any sense of instability. What are you preventing yourself from feeling? That's deep, man. Um, I suppose guilt, a lot of guilt. You know, this is advice to anybody whose parents are still alive. When your parents are gone, that door's closed. You know, that door to serving your parents is gone. You can never, ever get the reward of serving your parents once they leave this world. And that is one of the simplest doors to Jannah. One of the simplest ways to please Allah is by serving your parents. And I feel, and I don't even go there really in my heart, because when I do, I feel so bad at the times when I answered my parents back, at the times when I said I was too busy to help, at the times when I couldn't do what they wanted me to do, at the times when even when I lost my temper and shouted, man, you know, like I said, I, don't, I can't even go there because that's just all lost opportunity. Uh, when, I think, oh, when I think of meeting Allah, I just feel, feel shame really. The lack of gratitude and wasting of opportunities and uh, just hypocrisy and pretending to be one thing being another and just that's what I think when I think of meeting Allah I feel ashamed man. you know my mum used to say to me you can fool everyone but you can't fool yourself but you know what you can even fool yourself sometimes mm. you well, can even powerful. you can even fool yourself sometimes but you can't fool Allah man Allah knows man one of Allah's names is your protecting friend Man, name a time in your life where you have felt that name in existence. Listen, man, you guys, I don't know if you know. I was thrown out of a car on the other side of the world in New Zealand at 60 miles an hour. And my head smashed into the ground at 60 miles an hour. My brains were coming out of my head. I should not have walked away from that. I should have been dead there on the ground in New Zealand. And Allah protected me and Allah saved me. And, and I'm going to try not to get emotional again because it's just boring getting emotional every time, right? I was saved because of sadaqah. Charity saved me. And I'll tell you what happened. The day before I left or two days before I left for that trip to New Zealand, I was at a fundraiser where I'm in the crowd. I'm, one of the, I'm the audience now. And my friend is fundraising. And he's fundraising, he's fundraising. And it, it was, I'll tell you what it was for afterwards. And I said to my wife, I turned around and said to my wife, I said, man, and I had an intention. I came with the intention to give a certain amount of money. I knew how much I was going to give. Fundraising dinner, I'm going to give this much money at the fundraising dinner, right? I said to my wife, I said, you know what? Imagine if we just actually saved one person with this, what they're collecting for. They were collecting for a medical thing. I said, imagine we saved one person. And, I saw, and, and we gave six times more, the biggest donation I'd ever given to that point in my life. Six times more than we intended to give that night, right? And then forgot about it, went on holiday. Ten days later, my brains are coming out on the road in New Zealand. I had to be airlifted by helicopter. I had to be rushed into resus. I had to have emergency treatment and everything. And I walked out of that hospital later on that day. I walked out, okay, with my head all patched up and everything.
And you know what that sadaqah was? It was for a brain pressure sensor for the people of Gaza to stop them getting brain damage. That's what it was for. And I know that that donation saved me. I know, I know it. 100%. So that was Allah. You said he's the protecting friend. That was Allah's mercy protecting me. And I know that, that I, it was specifically to prevent brain damage for the people in Gaza. And literally, the, you know, a few days later, Alhamdulillah, Allah protected me. I'm not going to get emotional anymore, man. It's boring, man. I, I can't help it. These are, these are deep questions, man. Uh, what are you not being honest with yourself about? Oh, man. I don't know, man. I've got to think about that now. In general, in like in life, what am I not being honest with myself about? As a couple of habits that have creeped in in the last few years, which I've managed to rationalize that this is an acceptable level of sin. This is, a, this, is an, this is an acceptable level of, whereas if I go back, if I go back five years, 10 years, 20 years, definitely when I first started practicing, no way would I have accepted that in my life. No way. Think about someone in your life that is no longer here. What is the one lesson that they taught me? Well, I'm, I, I'm, I've lost both my parents. Um, which is the obvious one and there's a thousand lessons that they taught me so I'm gonna try and think of I'm gonna try and think of someone who's not my parents I remember the fear in the eyes of the Rohingya refugees that had such a, 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 a an impact on me that they I've seen so many different refugees around the world but none of them looked as beaten and as as hopeless as they did there was no hope in their eyes they were like I felt like if you said to them, listen, all you guys just round up, stand in the corner and we're going to shoot you, they would just go and stand in the corner. That's what it felt like. That they, they, they were gone. They were just gone. You know, they, 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 they had no hope left, is what it felt like. Whereas with the Syrian refugees and Palestinian refugees and stuff, they've got fight in them and they're angry and they're ready to go. And whatever. These guys had been so abused, there was nothing left. There was nothing left. You know, that's how it felt. And that, that had a big impact on me, I remember. I remember thinking there's all, only so much people can take, you know. Mm. There's only so much people can take and then there's just nothing left. Ugh. Alhamdulillah. Finish the sentence. It says, Dear Allah. It's too deep, man, this stuff, man. It's too deep. Dear Allah, let me see my parents again. Let me see my parents again, inshallah. Inshallah. Ameen. Ameen. Alhamdulillah. Oh man, I'm just flipping crying the whole way through, man. It's, it's, I told you, I, do you know how much I hate crying in public? I hate it. And yet everyone knows me for it. <laughs> Alhamdulillah. Thank you so much, man. Um, man. How was that? It was good, man. That was powerful, man. Much, much deeper than I thought.